hyperfine interactions. I don't know how often you meet that topic. Let me randomly pick somebody from the audience. What was the last time you worried about hyperfine interactions? Long time ago. Can you put a number on that? <laughs> Years. Really from, yeah. Yeah. It's very safe to do that test because if you ask about hyperfine interactions, the reaction is often, well, that doesn't matter for me. <laughs> Nevertheless, I think that matters for all of us. And one of the goals of this short presentation is that in half an hour you will understand one of the connections between hyperfine interactions and one aspect of your daily life, namely airport safety. There is a clear connection there. But before going to that point, we have to study a bit of physics. Let me go back to a slide that Karl Heinz presented on the first day, where you have the total energy in the Kohn-Sham procedure. And he discussed the different terms in this expression. You have the kinetic energy, you have the exchange correlation function of potential, and you have also here this term, where you have the interaction between the electron density and an external potential, which is the Coulomb potential created by the nuclei. And it went without saying that we consider these nuclei as point particles. So you have the Coulomb potential of a point particle. Well, what is a hyperfine interaction? That is every energy contribution that goes beyond that point particle approximation for a nucleus. By definition, that is called hyperfine interaction. To what extent can a nucleus be different from a point? Well, there are different aspects to that. Start at the left of this picture with a mathematical point nucleus. And here at the right, I have a cartoon of what would be a real nucleus. What are the differences? Well, first of all, a nucleus is not necessarily a point. It can be an object with some volume and with a particular shape, often these ellipsoid types of shape. <coughs> and it also doesn't need to be only an electric charge. A nucleus can have a magnetic dipole moment, which we will symbolize in this talk by a bar magnet with a north and a south pole. So these three aspects of the nucleus will allow the nucleus to interact in a different way than just a point particle with that surrounding electron cloud. All interactions that explicitly depend on these features of the nucleus, that will be the hyperfine interactions. And we will discuss three types of hyperfine interactions. The magnetic hyperfine interaction, the electric quadrupole interaction, and the isomer shifts. We will start with that magnetic hyperfine interaction. So I will symbolize the nucleus for this part with this bar magnet, and I will symbolize the electron system that surrounds the nucleus with an offer, an, a different type of object, namely with such a horseshoe magnet. So we have our nucleus in the center of an atom, surrounded by electrons. These electrons have some effect on the nucleus, and one of the effects the electrons have is creating a magnetic field at the position of the nucleus. We will forget about the origin of that magnetic field. We will forget that this is created by electrons. I will replace in my story these electrons by this horseshoe magnet. You remember from your first course in electromagnetism that there is a homogeneous electric field between a, a homogeneous magnetic field between the poles of this, this horseshoe magnet. And it's that homogeneous field that we will need. So I replace in this drawing, I indicate here the homogeneous magnetic field. And we can also indicate this by this uh, magnetic field vector that points from north to south pole. That's my electron system. In that homogeneous magnetic, magnetic field, I put the nucleus, which means I put there this bar magnet. 
And you know that these two objects interact with each other. Again, first course electromagnetism, the interaction energy between a dipole moment and a magnetic field is minus the dot product between these two vectors. Nature tries to minimize energies. So let's see how the nucleus wants to be oriented in this system. It will want to point with its magnetic field, with its magnetic moment vector, parallel to the magnetic field, such that this dot product is, is positive, and due to the minus sign, it's negative. That's the lowest possible energy. That means that the north pole of the magnet is pointing to the south pole of that horseshoe magnet. That's the lowest energy situation. Let's put that on a graph. Here you have energy as a function of an angle theta, which gives the orientation of that nuclear magnetic moment with respect to the vertical axis. And now, as it is drawn there, we are in the lowest energy situation. If we change the orientation of the nucleus, the energy goes up. And also on this energy axis, it goes up. We keep changing until we are in the maximal energy situation. Now, you have seen on this energy axis here that the point was taking different positions. It covers an entire range of energies. And this range I indicate here by the black bar. These are all the energies that a classical nucleus in this magnetic field can take. Now, I said a classical nucleus. A real nucleus is not a classical system. It's a quantum system. Only a discrete number of orientations are allowed. So let's take the example of a nucleus with spin 1 that can have three different orientations, maximally parallel to the z-axis, perpendicular to the z-axis, and maximally anti-parallel to the z-axis. So only these three orientations out of this entire range will be allowed for a nucleus with spin 1. So you get this kind of energy scheme, where the quantum number m tells you which of the three levels is taken by the nucleus. With this, we have readily the information to write down the Hamiltonian for this situation. And I have here the equation that relates the spin operator with the magnetic moment operator, and they are just proportional with an quantity mu that comes from experiment, which you can imagine as the magnitude of the magnetic moment vector of the nucleus. So you can replace in this classical formula the, ma the magnetic moment by the magnetic moment operator. You have this I operator, which makes the dot product with the magnetic field. If you take your Z axis along the magnetic field, you have only the Z component. I quickly rush through this small derivation, and the result is that the Hamiltonian for this system is a, a something, a scalar property, times this z component of the spin. That is almost everything there is to say about the magnetic hyperfine interaction. I will summarize it in a way that will be repeated for the other hyperfine interactions as well. You have a nuclear property, which was here the nuclear magne magnetic dipole moment. You have an electron property, which is the magnetic field at the position of the nucleus, the magnetic hyperfine field. And the energy due to, this, to, due to the interaction of these two properties, that is a dot product. A dot product between, in this case, two vectors. The magnetic dipole moment is a vector. The hyperfine field is a vector too. And we have seen even the Hamiltonian for that interaction. Now, in real atoms and solids, there is no horseshoe magnet that generates that magnetic hyperfine field. So let's make it a bit more realistic and see now where this hyperfine field comes from. And we will distinguish four different contributions. The first one is called the dipolar contribution to the hyperfine field. And its physical origin is the magnetic moment of the electrons. An electron has a spin, has therefore a magnetic moment. 
So you can visualize it as a bar magnet, and the magnetic field generated by that bar magnet will reach up to the nucleus. That's one reason why there can be a magnetic field at a nucleus. Apart from its spin, an electron also has charge. So a charged particle that is orbiting the nucleus, that's a current loop. First year of electromagnetism, a current loop, well, you have a magnetic field inside the loop. That is the orbital contribution to the hyperfine field. Then there is a contribution which is called the Fermi contact contribution, which in many cases is the dominant contribution, but which is not so easy, easily visualized in a classical way. It is the contribution that would be present between a magnetic uh, monopole that has a positive magnetic charge and a magnetic monopole that has a negative magnetic charge, which you cannot realize in classical physics because you have no magnetic monopoles. But if in a nucleus electrons would be able to go really inside the nucleus, they somehow get inside these two magnetic monopoles, and you get this type of contribution to the, to the hyperfine field. It is proportional to the spin density at r equals zero, so at the position of the nucleus. You count how many spin-up electrons you have inside the nucleus, and make the difference with the number of spin-down electrons inside the nucleus. And then there is a very classical contribution, which is now due to the bar magnets, the magnetic moments of all the surrounding atoms. Also, these can have fields that reach up to the nucleus of the atom you consider. So four different ways to produce a magnetic hyperfine field. Wien 2K can calculate all of, these four, all of these four properties. It cannot calculate the magnetic moment of the nucleus. That is a nuclear physics property. That is something we have to take from nuclear physics experiments. But the electron contribution, these four contributions to the magnetic hyperfine field, that can be calculated. How? That's summarized on this slide. This most important Fermi contact contribution that you get for free. If you look into the SEF file, there will be a label HFF and then the number of an atom. That is the Fermi contact contribution at the nucleus of that atom. If you want to calculate the orbital and dipolar contributions, you have to run after the SEF cycle the LAPWDM program where, and here I refer to the user's guide, where you have this type of input files, where you specify for which atom, for which orbital do you want to calculate this contribution. And if you replace these two numbers here, this 0, 0, by a 3 and 3, then it will give you the orbital hyperfine field. If you put a 3 and 5, you will have the dipolar hyperfine field. And there is an additional program, DPAN, that can be used to calculate in a very classical way this lattice contribution from the neighboring atomic moments. So you find here the places in the user's guide where you have this explanation. And a few years ago, I also made some, a short instruction video where you go through a calculation step by step and where you see what is happening, especially with these two contributions. I've put it now on YouTube. You can find it there. The address will be in the slides. So that's the magnetic, the magnetic hyperfine interaction. Second one, electric quadrupole interaction. What matters now is not the magnetic moment of the nucleus, but its volume and its shape. <coughs> Again, I will replace the electron system by something simple. So we had already the horseshoe magnet for the homogeneous magnetic field. Let's now take a parallel plate capacitor to have a homogeneous electric field. And I put in that homogeneous electric field first my point nucleus. Let's calculate the force that is felt by that point nucleus. First year electromagnetism. You take the charge of the point and multiply it by the electric field vector. 
let's repeat that for a nucleus that has a certain shape. Well, I have to take an infinitesimal contribution to the charge, multiply it by the electric field that is present at that infinitesimal point, and integrate it over the volume of the nucleus. But we had a homogeneous magnetic uh, electric field, so this is a constant vector. I can bring it out of the integral. We are left with the integral over dq, which is the total charge q. So the force felt by my complicated nucleus is exactly the same as the force felt by the point nucleus. Which means that this is not a hyperfine interaction. Hyperfine interactions were all effects that go beyond the point. So in this situation, there is no difference between the point and the complex nucleus. That means that this parallel plate capacitor is too simple to express this electric hyperfine interaction. We need a more complicated thing than just a homogeneous electric field. We need an inhomogeneous electric field, an electric field with a gradient. And you could create that, for instance, by putting two classical electrons on the z-axis. I freeze them at these positions. You look at the field lines, and clearly this is not a homogeneous electric field. How will a nucleus interact with this? So I put my complicated nucleus there in the center of these two classical electrons, and I will introduce some notation. Let's call the distance between these two electrons 2d. Let's call this the angle theta between the nucleus and the vertical axis. And I replace the nucleus by an even simpler object. I take this dumbbell with two positive point charges that are separated by a distance 2L. And I wonder, how will this nucleus behave in that situation? What will be its lowest energy orientation? This is a classical Coulomb interaction exercise, a bit of algebra, but you can surely work that out. And we find the Coulomb energy of that system as this expression here. And graphically, it looks like this. There are two orientations. So the horizontal axis is that angle theta. There are two orientations that have the lowest energy. And that is when the nucleus makes zero or 180 degrees with the vertical axis. And when it makes an angle of 90 degrees, you have the maximal energy. A point nucleus would not have this effect. If I would put just a point nucleus here, then however you rotate the point, you would have the same energy. So for a point nucleus, you would have a flat line. For this complicated nucleus, you have something that is different. So we have a hyperfine interaction. Again, I can indicate all energies that are reached by any of these orientations of a classical nucleus. But same story, this is not a classical nucleus. We introduce quantization. The example of a nucleus of spin 1 can have only two different orientations, parallel or anti-parallel with the z-axis. That's this lowest energy level. Or perpendicular to the z-axis, that's the highest energy level. People have also for this situation derived the Hamiltonian. You can find that in many textbooks, but it's a bit more complicated than for the magnetic case. So that is the form of this Hamiltonian. And with this formalism, you can start calculating these energy differences for real solids. So again, same structure as we had for the magnetic hyperfine field. We have a nuclear property which we have to take from nuclear physics. Now it's not a vector any longer. It's a tensor of rank 2, an object with 5 degrees of freedom. And we have a property due to the electron system, can be calculated by Wien 2K, is again a tensor of rank 2, so 5 degrees of freedom. You take the dot product of these two, and you get this interaction energy. How can Wien 2K give you that field gradient? Also, this comes for free. It's always available in the SCF file. So we need to have these five degrees of freedom. 
and you find them as the EFG label for a specific atom, the ETA label for a specific atom, and immediately thereunder you have um, three vectors that give you the principal orientations of that tensor, the principal axis system of that tensor, and that is, uh, that is again three pieces of information, so five in total. And you can do some more interpretation and post-processing of this information for which I refer to these sources. Magnetic, electric, now this isomer shifts. Let's come back to that same system. The curve you see there is the same curve you saw a few slides ago. Energy of this classical system as a function of the orientation. Now I make the system a little bit richer. I allow electrons to be inside the nucleus. I put an extra classical charge, a small charge, minus epsilon, at the center of that nucleus. And for this system, I calculate again this classical interaction energy. What will that be? Exactly the same angular dependence, but with an extra constant term. However you rotate this nucleus, the distance between the two positive charges and that extra negative charge will always be the same. So you have an extra contribution that has this value. So the entire curve shifts to a somewhat lower value. Let's play with that number. So I take that extra contribution and I multiply numerator and denominator by L squared. 2L, that was the length of this dumbbell. So I take half of that and I multiply both with L squared. Rearrange this a little bit and what do we recognize there? We have a factor L squared, which you could in a more general derivation identify as the mean square radius of that nucleus. And you have a factor epsilon, that small electron charge inside the nucleus, divided by something that has the dimensions of the volume of the nucleus. So we have electron density inside the nucleus. So in a more general derivation, that would be the electron density exactly at r equals zero at the origin of the axis system in the center of the nucleus. So what we see here is a classical representation of the quantum effect that if electrons are allowed to enter the nucleus, that will alter the Coulomb interaction a little bit. So we have again the, the same scheme. We have a nuclear property, which is now the volume of the nucleus, the mean square radius of the nucleus. We have an electron property. We in 2K can calculate this. This is the electron density at the center of the nucleus. And by making the dot product, which is in this case the normal product, you get the interaction energy due to this effect. So this is a property that can, um, that can be measured in atomic physics, the energy levels of different isotopes of, an, of a given element will not be exactly the same because different isotopes have different radii, so you will see small changes in these atomic <coughs> energy levels. It plays also a role in solid state physics. There is a technique called the Musbauer effect that is sensitive not really to this term, but due to, to a combination of terms. If you compare two solids where this effect is playing a different role, then you will be able to measure that difference. How do you get this electron density in the nucleus from Wien to K? It comes from free, the RTO keyword for a specific atom. So here we have all of them together, three times the same structure, a nuclear property that we have to take from nuclear physics experiments, an electron property that we in 2K can calculate. If you multiply them, if you take the dot product between them, you get three different contributions to the energy of your crystal, and that is the three examples of hyperfine energies. 
these hyperfine interactions, so this electric field gradient, this magnetic hyperfine field, and this charge density in the nucleus, they can be measured by a lot of techniques. It's not the goal to discuss any of these here. Just one I want to pick out, the second one in the list, NQR, nuclear quadrupole resonance, because that is the one that plays a role in some of these airport scanners. So what is going on there? It's a method that is sensitive to this electric quadrupole interaction. So we just understood that if we put a nucleus with a given spin in an electric field gradient, such as the gradient of the electric field that the electron cloud produces, that there will be different energy levels possible. Where are these energy levels? What is the distance of the energy difference between these two outer levels, for instance? That is determined by how strong this electric field gradient is. The stronger the gradient, the larger the separation. That means that is a property of the electron cloud. The, there is in a given molecule, in a given crystal, the particular electron configuration that you have will generate an electric field gradient that is as it is. You cannot tune that. Nature decides that for you. So if I take a molecule, here in this case a molecule from TNT, an explosive, and if I look at the blue atoms, which are nitrogen atoms, well, for each of these three nitrogen atoms, there is a specific configuration of neighboring atoms and therefore a, a surrounding electron cloud that is as nature wants it to have in this TNT molecule. So if you would be able to measure the three field gradients at these three nitrogen positions, you would have a fingerprint for this TNT molecule. There is only one molecule in nature that has exactly this combination of three electric field gradients. Well, that is what happens in such a scanner. You send radio waves to the luggage that passes. Radio waves have about the energy that is needed to, to cover this transition. If there is a TNT molecule, then it will absorb these radio waves at these three energies. And if you then have a database that knows uh, this combination of three absorption energies, that must be TNT, then you stop that luggage. This is often used for explosives because most explosives contain nitrogen-oxygen bonds. And these nitrogen-oxygen bonds store a lot of energy. That is what makes TNT an explosive. Semtex has this, RDX has this. So that's a convenient method to measure explosives. TATP, which is popular among terrorists right now, doesn't have nitrogen included. And that's why it's so hard to detect this TATP. So if you care about safe flying, then you have to care also a bit about hyperfine interactions, which is the message I wanted to bring today. Thank you.